Praise God. And as you know, we started this series called Suit Up, praise God, where we talked about the different armors that God has given us mentioned in Ephesians 6. We have covered the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. We've also covered the shoes of the gospel of peace. Today we'll be covering the shield of faith, the shield of of faith. So today's title is Suit Up Part 4, Quenching the Fiery Arrows, the Fiery Arrows. Praise God. As I mentioned in the previous weeks, the full armor of God mentioned in Ephesians 6 was inspired by the Roman soldiers of the Apostle Paul's day. The shield that the Roman soldiers of that time would carry was called the secutum. This type of shield was as large as a door and would cover the soldier entirely. The shield wasn't just defensive, but could also be used to push back the enemy. When fighting as a group, soldiers could position their shields together to form an enclosure around themselves called the testudo. I have a picture of that so that you can see what I'm talking about. This formation was called the Test Tudor, where the soldiers would come together and put their shields together. And it was helpful to protect against the arrows that were launched from the walls of the cities that they were attacking. The shield was also often made of wood, then covered in hide and then wetted so that it could extinguish the flaming arrows. Thank you for the image. In Ephesians 6, 16, the apostle Paul tells us that in every circumstance, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. From verse 16, we get to understand that the enemy doesn't only attack us through his schemes, the enemy also attacks by shooting um, flaming arrows at us with the intention to spiritually injure, destabilize, or even worse, cause spiritual death to the believer. And the only way that we can protect ourselves, the only way that we can extinguish these arrows is by taking up the shield of faith at every situation. Not once in a while, not when we feel like it. No, in every situation we must take up the shield of faith. Notice that we are told to take up the shield of faith. With all the other, all the previous armors, we are told to put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, to put on the shoes of peace. But with faith, we don't wear it. We hold on to our faith like a shield. Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. We are able to hold on to faith because our God is faithful and trustworthy. So what are these fiery arrows, these fiery darts that the enemy launches at us? These fiery arrows include the arrow of temptation. Every single one of us here is prone to one type of temptation or the other. It doesn't matter how holy you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been coming to KICC. There is something that tempts you. Look straight. That's the thrill. However, we shouldn't blame ourselves when we are being tempted. Jesus was also tempted by Satan. Temptation is part of hum- the human condition and is used by the enemy to make us to fall. Temptation isn't a sin until it is acted upon. Never forget that. Never feel guilty because you were tempted. You have not sinned. It's only a sin when you act on it. All of us will be tempted from time to time. 
Someone said all the time. May God help you. No, I was joking. Maybe what tempts you is that pastry shop that you walk past every day when you're going to work and you smell the warm dough and the pastry and it makes your mouth to water and you know you shouldn't enter that shop because you're trying to get into shape. You know, let me, let me be trans, transparent. I think this is one of my temptations and recently I actually um, started with a personal trainer because um, I was tired of my dad bod. So, um, uh, yeah, so I got a personal trainer because this is somewhere that God is helping me with. Sometimes I find myself in the pastry aisle in Sainsbury's and <laughs> I see cookies that I know I shouldn't eat and the cookie's looking at me, I'm looking at the cookie and, and I'm ministering to myself as to why I should not eat this cookie. So we all face temptations, or maybe your temptation is spending too much money on clothes or the latest gadgets. When you get that email that this thing has been released, you're tempted to buy the newest thing. Or maybe your temptation, like most people, is Amazon. Buying stuff that you don't need and hiding the boxes from your spouse. (laughs) Praise God, I'll leave it there. Or maybe the temptation is a bit more serious. Maybe the temptation is lying and cheating to advance your agenda. Or maybe it's the temptation to do things your way because the way God told you to do it is too long and it's much more difficult. Or maybe it could be lustful temptation, viewing things you shouldn't do or doing things you know you shouldn't do with that person that you're not married to yet or that person that isn't your spouse. Whatever the temptation is that you face, when it comes to these fiery arrows, the enemy will get you to believe that this thing in front of you is better than what God has for you. The devil will try and make it seem that God is holding back from you. The enemy will whisper, why wait for what God has for you? When you can have this thing right now, don't miss this opportunity. Things have been tight. Money has been tight. Yeah, this deal is dodgy, but it will get you money. Nothing else is working. The enemy will whisper, ah, she looks beautiful. He, he looks handsome. Oh, you, you know you can't resist and God will forgive you anyway. He's a God of mercy. No, no, no. Those are all lies of the enemy. When the enemy tempts us, he will always present the temptation in a nice and beautiful way. He will always show us the good side of the temptation, but he will never show us the consequences of that temptation. For example, the enemy will package the wrong opportunity in such a way that it will be crazy to not take up that opportunity that has landed on your lap. You know it's not in God's plan for you, but the benefits are too much and it ticks all the boxes. But the enemy will never present the consequences of taking that wrong opportunity. Consequences such as delay. When someone does their own thing, when they do what God hasn't told them to do, but they couldn't resist that opportunity because it was so good, when it doesn't work out the way they thought it would work out, when they realize that God is not backing them in this opportunity, it sets them back, it delays them because they have to start all over again and get back on the right path. But Satan wouldn't show you that. Even a job offer can be a wrong opportunity. You see the salary, you quickly jump to the salary calculator on Google and see, yay, is this what I'll be bringing home? Yet God is not in it. Another consequence that the devil doesn't show when someone takes matters into their own hands because of impatience is that you could actually miss out on the right opportunity as you are pursuing the wrong opportunity. 
you need to know that some breakthroughs have time stamps attached to it. Once that time has passed, that opportunity doesn't come again. And this is why we must be like the sons of Issachar, men who knew how to discern the times and seasons. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death, Proverbs 14, 12. There is an opportunity that appears to be right. There is a man or woman that appears to be the one. There is a business deal that appears to be right, but it ends, it leads to death. When it comes to the fiery arrow of temptation, the enemy will present lust as fun and pleasurable and thrilling and passionate. And it's like it's the forbidden fruit and it's like passionate and it's ooh la la. But he will never present the consequences. He will never show you unwanted pregnancy. He will never show you STIs. He will never show you broken fellowship with God. He will never show you broken trust when getting married. What do I mean? Young people, if you're courting someone and you're sleeping together, when you get married, there is a very high percentage that distrust will enter your marriage. Why? Because I give myself as an, an example. Me and my wife, glory to God, we kept ourselves. And because we kept ourselves, there's a trust. We could trust each other because it's like if she didn't want to sleep with me and I didn't want to sleep with her, the person that I want to spend my life with, if they could control themselves when it was me, then I'm confident that they can control themselves with others. I know that's not popular, but it's the truth. Take it from an OG. I'm 40, I'm great, I know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Trust me. Trust me. But that doesn't mean you should call me uncle. Some young people have been calling me. They should stop that or we'll revoke your membership. (laughs) You know, the the devil doesn't show the consequences of lust. He doesn't show the consequences. Consequences like demonic soul ties. You know, we don't talk about soul ties anymore in the church. When I was in Nigeria, it's always Nigeria. There was a guy given a testimony who, unfortunately, he fell and he slept with someone. And as soon as he slept with that person, he lost his job. Things began to scatter. And when he investigated, he found out that the the family that the girl was in, none of the men were employed. Things were just messed up. You see, the enemy will show you that, wow, she's peng, she's beautiful, he's handsome, he's this. But he won't show you that your life will scatter when you pull up your trousers. This is raw. He won't show you that. He will show you the curves, he will show you the six-pack. The chest as wide as Australia, but he won't show you the consequences. This is the devil's schemes and trickery. Fulfilling temptation may feel good now, but it will always present itself as a horror story later. The enemy uses the fiery dart of temptation to derail us from God's perfect plan for our lives. Another of the enemy's arrows is the arrow of doubt. The devil wants to disarm us of our faith and begin to doubt God. He will whisper in our ears, is God really listening to your prayers? If God is so good, why hasn't he put a stop to your struggles? Did God really tell you to do that the other way is easier? 
Did God really tell you to marry that person because right now they're a headache? God can't forgive you. Your past is too messy. These are lies that the enemy whispers so you begin to doubt God. The devil will try and also get you to doubt your God-given ability so that you never step out and carry out the dreams and the plans that God has placed on your life. With the fiery arrow of doubt, the enemy will try and get you to doubt who you are in Christ. In fact, he is so cheeky, he will try and make you doubt your salvation. He will ask you, are you really born again? How many of you have ever heard that whisper before? I've heard it, so you can put your hand up. No, for real. Are you really born again? Are, are you really going to heaven? These are lies of the enemy. Arrows shot at you so that you doubt, so that you are disarmed with faith. Did yet the devil uses doubt to bring confusion and hopelessness to components that result in stagnation. Ungodly thoughts is another arrow that the enemy fires at us. How many of us have had the most negative, craziest thought that just came out of the blue? You had no idea where this thought came from. In fact, you couldn't believe that you had fought it and you suddenly felt condemned. This is tactics of Satan to fight us. These are arrows that he fires. These are the fiery arrows that he fires against us. He pushes negative thoughts to try and hold us down and make us live in fear. These thoughts don't ask for permission to enter your mind. They come rapidly and stick to the walls of your mind. Maybe it's thoughts of jealousy and envy causing you to be bitter, or maybe it's always thinking that people don't like you, so you carry yourself in the way of a victim. Or maybe it's suicidal thoughts that are fueled by the enemy's lies, the enemy lying to you that things will never change, the enemy lying that this issue can never be resolved and it will be with you forever or no one will forgive you. These are lies of the enemy. Or could it be thoughts of doing things you know you could never ever commit? These thoughts are engineered by the devil to destabilize you as a Christian. It's destabilizing because it's draining having to fight these thoughts on a daily basis. How about the arrow of discouragement? The devil uses the arrow of discouragement to push the narrative that God has forgotten you. He's left you alone. Discouragement is powerful because it causes people to just give up. The assignment of the arrow of discouragement is to cause someone to question God and say, why did God let this happen? Does God really care about me? Has God forgive, forgotten me? Has God forgotten me because I'm still waiting for a life partner? I'm still waiting for the fruit of the room. I've, I've, I've been fasting and I've been praying, yet there is nothing. Has God forgotten me? This is an arrow that the enemy fires at us. An, enemy, an arrow of discouragement. Discouragement also comes even when you're on the right path. Even when you're on the path that God has put you on, discouragement can come. When things are not going right on that path, you're on the right path, but things are not going right. Things are just drying up. The enemy will use the lack of progress as an arrow of discouragement to try and throw you off and try other alternatives. The enemy will say you're wasting your time when really you're just a few moves away from making progress that will make the months of no progress look like child's play. But you have to stand firm with the shield of faith. The arrow of discouragement is very effective because it makes people to not bother anymore. 
It causes people to doubt prayer and fasting so they don't bother with prayer and fasting. The arrow of discouragement is effective because it stops people from hoping. And Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you're not hoping, there is no faith. Why? Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. If there's no faith, there is no shield, which means you are open to attack there are many arrows that the enemy uses but I'll mention one more because I don't want to bombard you with negativity although it's good to know what these arrows are so that you can plan yourself you can prepare yourself and stand firm The last arrow, which I believe is one of the deadliest arrows, is the arrow of fear. Fear keeps a person locked up. As long as they don't step out, they will remain a prisoner in a free world. It stops people from stepping out into what God has called them into. When I first started preaching, I was very, very fearful of public speaking. In fact, it got to a point where if my dad called me, I'll be like, God, please don't let him tell me I'm taking Sunday. That's the kind of fear that will grip me. And I could have easily given in to that fear and never, ever step on stage, meaning that I will never enter destiny. This is the kind of thing that fear does. You have to do it, even if you're afraid, do it anyway. God will meet you halfway. Fear stops us from fulfilling purpose. Fear is so powerful. It's such an overwhelming feeling but we have to trust God fear is so powerful because it gets people to reduce God and magnify the problem in front of them fear makes people settle for less it makes them settle for things that they know aren't good for them but because of what God has for them is scary and hard they settle The Israelites wanted to go back to Egypt and become slaves again because going to the promised land seemed too hard. Imagine that, wanting to go back to Egypt to be slaves. That shows you the potency of fear. I've given this example before. There was when I was in Nigeria with my wife and we were thinking about coming back to the UK and when I was feeling the call to come into ministry because any time I would plan something, I would just have this sensing that your time here is running out. Your time here in Nigeria is running out. Don't bother. When it was now time to make announcements, everyone was scared. People were saying, oh, what is your dad going to say? Are you sure? Have you fought it through? Have you prayed? Ah, I could have been fearful. Their fear could have rubbed off on me and I could have remained in Nigeria, not fulfilling destiny, just there in the hot sun sweating, (laughs) in three hours traffic, not fulfilling destiny. But I chose to say yes to faith and no to fear. You too have that opportunity. I don't know what is making you afraid. I don't know what people have been saying that if you make that move, that is crazy. I want you to lean on God and just trust him. Just do it anyway. He will catch you. He won't let you fall. He won't make you be disgraced. Especially if you have prayed about it and you've received the peace, just go ahead and do it. Stop wasting time. Life is too short. Yeah. 
Fear causes people to stay silent when they should speak up. This is an arrow that the UK church is currently dealing with. Afraid to speak up against laws that go against the word of God. Fear causes us to take matters into our own hands. Sarah was afraid that she will never conceive, so she took matters into her own hands, and we all know how that ended. Fear causes you to seek the easier way rather than the right way. Sometimes the right way is the hardest way. Never forget that. Just because God said you should take that way doesn't mean it's going to be easy. These fiery arrows of the enemy which I have mentioned are all lies, tricks, and schemes of the enemy. However, these arrows come fast and furious. And what makes these arrows devastating is that these arrows are fiery arrows, meaning that they are on fire. And because they are on fire, when they land, the flames don't stay in one place. The flames spread across people's minds, lives, and livelihoods. It doesn't stay in one place, it spreads. Yes, these arrows are are lies, but when it hits someone, the lies spread. Causing chaos and mayhem. But everyone, be encouraged there is good news. And the good news is that we can defend ourselves against these arrows. There is hope because these fiery arrows can be quenched when we take up the shield of faith, meaning no weapon formed against us shall prosper. The weapon may have been formed, the weapon may have even been launched, but it will not prosper. I said it will not prosper in the name of Jesus. The shield of faith, just like the Roman soldier's shield, covers us. The shield given to us by God can withstand the impact of these fiery blows from the devil. But remember, it was the wetness of the Roman soldier's shield that made it possible to quench the fiery darts that were shot at them. In the same way, we keep our shield of faith wet with the word of God. Why? Because the word gives us faith, enabling us to take up our faith like a shield. Romans 10, 17 says, So then comes by hearing and hear, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word gives us faith, which we hold up like a shield. To be very, very plain, it's faith in God and his word that activates the shield. Not your parents' faith, not your friend's faith, not your spouse, not your partner's faith, but your faith. You cannot contract your faith. Remember, taking up the full armor of God requires individual effort. No one is going to put on the full armor of God for you. No one is going to carry the shield of faith for you. The most we can do is pray for you, but you need to take up the shield yourself. God has played his part, and he has given us everything that we need to be successful in this spiritual war. You have everything you need to stand firm. Nothing missing. 2 Peter 1.3 says, God has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. He has given us all things to life and pertaining to life and godliness. Living a godly life also includes living a victorious life over the schemes of the enemy. 1 Corinthians 15.57 says, but thanks be to God. He has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We receive the victory already given to us by Christ by playing our part. Some people are probably saying, this verse says that we have been given victory, but I'm not seeing victory in my life. That's because you have to play your part also. 
by doing everything that will enable you to suit up in the full armor of God. You can't sit down and expect to gain the victory. That's not how it works in the kingdom. You must play your part. The Bible informs us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What does that mean? It means faith is having confidence about an expectation or a request you have presented to God without any visible proof that that expectation or request will come to pass. There's no evidence that this request will come to pass, but you trust God and have confidence that he will fulfill his promises. That is what faith is. To make things even more plain, the most basic definition of faith is acting like God's word is true. A key word in that statement that I just made, acting like God's word is true, is the word acting. Meaning it's not enough to feel like God's word is true. Feeling doesn't do jack. Your feelings don't mean nothing. It is our actions. Faith without works is dead. It didn't say faith without emotions, faith without crying, faith without this and that. No, it says faith without works is dead. Habakkuk 2, 4 says, but the just shall live by faith. What Habakkuk is trying to tell us, what he's trying to get across is that faith is a lifestyle. It's not a feeling. Faith is a lifestyle. Faith isn't a one-time event. Faith isn't when, oh, I need something from God, so I'm going to activate faith. When I get it, now I disappear. No, faith is a lifestyle. Even in the good, even in the bad, you're walking in faith. God is not a genie where you rub the bottle and he comes out and says, my child, what do you want today? No, you are kidding yourself. The just shall live by faith. Faith is a lifestyle. We live by faith. We live by faith. What does it mean to live by faith? To live by faith is to have faith that God is with you even when it feels like he's not there. To live by faith is to believe God's word even when it looks like the circumstances are different from what God has said in his word, even when it looks like God's word is contradicting what you are going through. That's what it means to live by faith. You're going to believe the word anyway. You're going to act like God is telling the truth. To not live by faith is to call God a liar. It's an insult when we don't live by faith. You're basically saying, Lord, this Bible that, that, that you got some, some man, men to write, it's a lie. That's what you're doing. Why would God answer the prayers of someone that is calling him a liar every day? Let that sink in. I know you don't like that, but that's what not walking in faith is, calling God a liar. It's like, God, I don't trust you. Let me talk to my Godfather. Let me talk to that uncle. He said he will promise me this and that. Let me talk to that HR person. They said that they can hook me up. That's what not walking on faith is. Telling God, sit down. It's, it's, no, that's disrespectful. To live a life of faith is to trust God that God has heard your request, is working on your request, and you have no plan B. Which means faith can be defined as having no plan B. What is faith? Having no plan B. That's what faith is. Trusting God, having no plan B. Because, you know, Paul, his writing can be difficult. When he says the substance of this, of that, it's like, what is he saying? I've given you a new definition. Trust God, no plan B. Apostle Toby. That's right. I was joking before the gospel police come for me. Anyway, to live a life of faith is to wait on the Lord, knowing he will renew your strength. 
you will mount up with wings as eagles. You shall run and not be weary. You will walk and not be faint. That's what living a life of faith is. Waiting on God, knowing that he will strengthen you as you are in this trial. It's tough, but he strengthens you. It's tough, but you don't faint. It's tough, but you don't grow weary because you're waiting on God. If you wait on that person that promised you that, this and that, you'll be frustrated. You will faint. You will fall. And you will not mount up like an eagle. Living by faith is waiting on God. Waiting on God. Waiting well as well. Waiting without complaining. Waiting without alternatives lined up just in case. To live by faith is to honor and respect what God has instructed you to do no matter how hard it seems. The only way to have confidence about an expectation or a a request that you have presented to God without any visible proof that it will come to pass is by studying the word of God. The only way to have confidence to live a lifestyle of faith with no plan B is by getting into the word of God. If you want to increase your faith so you can live a lifestyle of faith so that you can trust God, you must grow in your understanding of God. And we do that by getting into the word of God. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want your faith to increase, get into the word of God. Remember what I've been saying these past weeks. The word of God ties all this armor together. When you're in the word of God, when the word is in your heart, you put on the belt of truth, which holds all the pieces together. The word of God helps you to know what pleases God and what displeases God, empowering you to now live a life of righteousness. And when you do that, you have the breastplate of righteousness on protecting your heart the word of God gives you peace which means you are wearing the shoes of peace standing firm the word builds your faith allowing you to take up your faith like a shield blocking and quenching the fiery arrows of the enemy you cannot avoid the word of God you cannot it ties everything together. Therefore, you must prioritize studying the word, living out the word, so that when you encounter these arrows that the enemy fires at us, we can hold the word of God concerning the situation we find ourselves in. Never forget, it's the word of God. It's the word of God. It's the word. The most common way God speaks to his people is through the word. Stop always expecting this still, small voice. He speaks mostly through his word. Sometimes when you're waiting for a small, still voice, you will hear the wrong voice. (laughs) Be careful. When we hold on to the word and have faith in God's word, living like God's word is true, we are lifting up the shield of faith. The shield of faith is lifted when we choose faith over arrows of fear and doubt fired at us. The shield of faith is lifted when we choose faith and bring every negative thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and believe what the word of God has said about us. The shield of faith is lifted when we choose faith in times of discouragement, in times of waiting, and in all situations. When we choose faith, we activate the shield. Remember that the shield didn't only just 
protect the soldier from the arrows. As I mentioned earlier, the shield allowed the soldier to push back the enemy. So having faith in God's word helps us to push back against the lies of the enemy. When Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus used the word as an act of faith and pushed back against the enemy. So if Jesus did it, you have to do it also. There's no shortcuts. I'm sorry. There's no magic pill. you, You have to put in the work. Christianity is not for the lazy. Someone should tweet that. Lastly, as we fellowship together, we can use our collective faith to help each other. When one of us are going through things, when some of us are having issues or circumstances or doubts, we could come together and form a stronger barrier against the devil. When we come together as a collective with all our shields, we too are in the testudo formation. Let me have that picture up again of the, of the soldiers. When we come together with our shield of faith, we too are in this formation. And as the enemy is trying to attack one of us, he can't because we have come together in unison. We have joined our faith together and we are in this position and the enemy can't do anything. This is why we need to walk in love. This is why we need to care about each other. Otherwise, you will just be an island on your, by yourself. When this service is over, I want you to intentionally greet someone you've never met before. There's cameras watching and there's sound as well. I was joking. I was joking. Very quickly, practical steps. What to do when an arrow has been shot. Remember, weapons are formed, but it's up to us to make sure that they do not prosper. Let's say someone lied about you. Let's say someone offended you and you start to feel bitterness, anger. Um, Someone spread a rumor about you. You start to feel fear. Uh, um, That fear and that bitterness that you are feeling is a fiery arrow that Satan has sent to destroy you. The same is with any other negative feeling. When, when, when there's feelings of lust or greed or impatience, it's an arrow that has been sent. So what do you do? First of all, you need to identify that an arrow has been shot. What is the arrow that has been shot? Number two, let me go slowly. You need to identify that an arrow has been shot. What is the arrow that has been shot? I'm feeling angry. This person offended me. Satan is trying to get me angry so I can walk in bitterness. Number two, believe that the arrow, believe God that the arrow can be quenched. When the fiery arrow lands and you feel in your heart, your heart is filling up with the wrong emotions, it can be sometimes tough to let go of that emotion. Sometimes feelings are so intense. That's why it's crucial to know and believe that the fiery dart can be quenched by the shield of God. You cannot quench the arrow by trying to not feel bitter, by trying to not feel lustful. No, you can't quench the arrow by breathing deeply and counting to 10. No, none of those things are walking by faith. Forget all that new age stuff. Tell you to count to 10 and hum and stuff. No, that's not faith. You quench the arrow by trusting all that God has promised to you through Jesus Christ. You quench the arrow by believing like the Bible is true, like God is telling the truth. You quench the arrow by living a life of faith and asking God to help you to hold up the shield, to extinguish the fiery arrows of the enemy. However, if you're in a position of lust, Do not stay there and be thinking. Do a Joseph and run and flee. When you're in a lustful situation, that's not the time to be trying to remember what did Pastor Toby preach. When you're in that room alone with the person, oh, what did Toby, Pastor, no, you run. That's the only time where you don't, you run. God presents, he always presents a way of escape. Always. 
Sometimes you're on the way to their house, you get a flat tire. That's the way of escape. You just go to Halfords, get your tire fixed, you go home. You don't go to that person's house again. <laughs> it's quiet. It's like, has it happened to someone? <laughs> I was joking. <laughs> okay, okay, praise God. To sum everything up, we take up the shield of faith by living a lifestyle of faith and talking by faith. How have you been living? What have you been saying? From today, I believe that your life and speech will be full of faith in the name of Jesus. Let's just stand up, begin to magnify the name of the Lord. Thank him for this word that we've received. Thank him for this word. We thank you for the this word, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you have armed us with the shield of faith that protects us from the dangerous, fiery arrows of the evil one. We thank you, Lord God, that you care so much for us, that you have equipped us. You have given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. You have given us everything to make us successful, to stand firm against the fiery darts of the enemy, against the schemes and the lies of the enemy. So we thank you. Begin to thank him. Thank him, thank him, thank him. We do not take it for granted. We do not take this equipment for granted. This equipment is what determines between life and death. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you have not left us on our own, but that you protect us every day, oh God. Lord, I now begin to just ask God for the grace to take up the shield of faith the grace to, to quench these fiery arrows. Sometimes when these arrows hit, it's very hard to not be angry. It's very hard to not be fearful. It's hard to not be bitter. It's hard. Lost sometimes it's hard to get rid of. So begin to just pray for the grace, the grace, the grace. To know his word so much that you are able to lift up the shield of faith and extinguish these darts as they come. Lord, we ask for the grace. We ask for an incredible hunger for your word. Because it's your word that ties all this equipment together. If we don't have the word, we don't have the belt. If we don't have the word, we can't live righteously, which means the breastplate is not on us. If we don't have the word, then we don't have, on, we don't have peace, which means we can't have on the shoes of peace. If we don't have the word, then our faith is not built up, which means that we don't have the shield and we are open to attack. So begin to ask God for an incredible hunger for his word. Ask him to help you to prioritize studying his word. His word is life. His word is life. His word is food to our spirit. No longer will we be malnourished. No, we will eat, on, we will eat the word of God so that our spirit man is nourished. So for some of us here, your breakthrough is, it, it just requires you to spend time in the word and things will turn, turn around. If you can just determine to read the word, study the word, you will see even in that week that you have made up your mind, things begin to turn around. Thought patterns beginning to leave your life. So begin to beg God for hunger for his word. The grace to study his word, grace to read the word. I'm telling you, the word of God is the most powerful thing. Not a new job, not a new car, not a new contract, not this, not that. No, if you don't have the word, all those things are a waste of time. What does it profit a man to gain this whole world and then lose his soul? Don't let earthly things stop you from studying the word of God and pursuing God. Pursue God more than we pursue success. Pursue God more than we pursue education. Pursue God more than we pursue money. All those things you can't take to heaven. You can have all those things and still be broken. If your name is Vicky, you know a Vicky, your name is Vicky, please come to the front if your name is Vicky. And please help me just begin to pray in the spirit. Begin to raise your voice. Pray loudly, please. Just 
Let's pray in the spirit. Let's saturate this place. If your name is Vicky, or you know a Vicky, I guess Vicky's are also known as Victoria as well. Rika Satara Mashikiri Katara Baba. Rika Santara. Your name has come up because God wants to do something. God wants to intervene. So as you're in the front, I want you to pray. Begin to raise your voice. If your name is Vicky, pray. Pray for the person that you know as Vicky or Victoria. Begin to raise your voice. Raise your voice. God is going to do something today. I heard the name clearly, Vicky. So God is going to do something today. Begin to pray for the people in the front. Heavenly Father, I commit your daughter's friend Vicky into your hands. Thank you for her life, Heavenly Father. Marital issues or feelings of when am I going to get married? I, I speak peace, Heavenly Father. I speak peace. No rush in the mighty name of Jesus. No rush. Peace, peace, oh God. Concerning marriage, peace, Heavenly Father. Concerning partnership, peace, oh God. No more despair. No more heartache, Lord God. In the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, commit your daughter Vicky into your hands. I thank you for her life, Lord God. I pray victory over her life. I pray victory over her life, Lord God. Victory, 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 oh God. I come against the lies of the enemy. I come against the whispers of the enemy. Lord, I pray heavenly Father for daybreak. Daybreak. She's been in darkness too long. I pray for daybreak, Lord. Where she sees your light, Heavenly Father. Light, illumination, oh God. Light, illumination, Heavenly Father. Clarity, Lord. So that she can see where she is going, Heavenly Father. I speak victory, victory, peace, especially light, daybreak. The pain is over. night but joy comes in the morning when the day is breaking for you in the jail. Heavenly Father, I commit to the kids to your hands, Lord God. Heavenly Father, commit the wickedness to your hands, Lord God. Bless them, keep them, Lord God. Have your way in their life, Lord God. Children, Heavenly Father, do only what you can do. Concerning children, Lord, I have prayed, Lord God, do what only you can do, Lord God. I pray concerning children, I speak peace. I speak the blood of Jesus, Lord. Blood of Jesus. Do they have children? I speak peace over that child. That pregnancy will be successful in the name of Jesus. Come against every fiery dart of the enemy. Lord, we pray that your perfect will will be done.
praise God, I was praying with this lady and she knows two Vickies um, without giving too much away, but one of them, as I was praying, I heard the word children, child. One of the Vickies is pregnant and the other Vicky is going on the wrong path. So I just want you to begin to stretch your hand towards this lady. Let's collectively bring our faith together bring our shields of faith together so that any evil intention that the enemy has towards this pregnancy will not prosper. Begin to raise your voice. The lady is very due soon and God has shown this for a reason. So we speak protection. We speak life. No weapon formed against that child shall prosper in the name of Jesus. Rika satara musika tarama, rike sete kiri kushanta raba baba baba, rike sete kiri kushanta rama, rika satara baba 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 baba, rika tara baba. It is done in Jesus' name. Let us begin. Continue to raise our voice. Continue to raise our voice. Stretch your hands towards these people. Who's the Vicky? My sister. Heavenly Father, commit Vicky into your hands. Thank you for her life. Lord, I come against wandering. I come against the spirit of just wandering round and round and round, oh God. Lord, I decree and declare stability, Heavenly Father. Stability in her life, Heavenly Father. In the life of her sister, Lord God. I speak stability and peace. Lord, your word says, after we have suffered a little while, that you will stabilize us, Lord God. You will make us what we ought to be, Heavenly Father. So I pray, Lord God, what this lady ought to be, Lord God, that you will make her that person that you have called her to be. Lord, I come against wandering. I come against wandering, wandering round and round in circles, Lord God. Give her clarity, give her direction on what she should do, Heavenly Father. Clear direction, oh God. No more wondering. No more guessing. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I commit Vicky into your hands. Yeah, are you Vicky? I commit Vicky into your hands, oh God. I thank you for her life. I commit her education into your hands. I'm here in education. I commit her schooling into your hands, oh God. I pray for protection. I pray for peace, oh God. I pray, Lord God, that she will be 10 times better than her peers, oh God. I pray, Heavenly Father, that she will excel in everything that she does, Heavenly Father. Everything that is tying her down, everything that is slowing her down, all those weights, oh God. I come against it in the name of Jesus. And I speak freedom, 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 freedom. I speak peace of mind. Peace of mind. I come against the lies of the enemy. With the fiery dart, darts of doubt. Discouragement, I come against it. Lord, fill your daughter with hope. Hope, hope. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we just commit everyone here in the front by the name of Vicky or representing a Vicky or Victoria, Lord God. And Lord, we just seal every prayer with the blood of Jesus. Lord God. Everything that was troubling them, Lord, leaves them today in the name of Jesus. Everything that they, would, they are trusting you for, Lord God, is answered in the name of Jesus. Lord, you do not call out names for the fun of it. You call it out because you want to do something. So, Lord, I ask, do what you want to do freely in these lives, oh God. They will come back and testify in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Let's praise our Heavenly Father. You may go back to your seat. Praise God.